Welcome back, all you millions of brothers and sisters. Okay, maybe a dozen, a baker's dozen. We're going to finish the book of Joel today, like I promised. Uh, we'll be in Joel chapter 3. Um, obviously, you know what the subject is because it was the same subject in Joel 1 and Joel 2. But it's interesting um, uh, in regards to what's the sign in the sun, moon, and stars mentioned in Joel 3 compared to Joel 2. How do they differ? What seal, trumpet, or bowl are we talking about? Are we talking about different phases of the day of the Lord? The appointed time of the end. So, uh, I'm going to show you how to match up Joel chapter 3 with the book of Revelation, for example. And we might even talk a little bit about some of the other a day of the Lord prophecies, uh, major and minor prophets of the Bible. Talking about the same future event. Okay. So if you've ever been confused, is Joel 1, 2, and 3 con all concerning a future time in our very near future? The answer is yes. That's why I can't put this stuff down. Eschatology. I can't put it down once I came to the understanding that, hey, all the primary subject of all the major and minor prophets of the Old Testament are about what is uh, soon to happen on planet Earth. It is. Father uh, has done things in the past in regards to the people of Israel. Very similar to what he's going to do. So sometimes when you're reading prophecies and you're trying to figure out in the major and minor prophets, is that prophet talking about an event that's about to befall Israel in his day? Or is the prophecy actually, and it's not the action of the prophet, it's the action of the Spirit of God, the Word of God. Yahweh, the Holy One of Israel, Spirit, actually telling the last generation of Israel and anyone else with an ear to hear and an eye to see, especially the followers of Jesus Christ in the last days, but he's getting ready to tell us what is going to happen. Not only what's going to befall Israel, but also the world. And when you, this helps, this study helps us understand New Testament chapters like 1 Thessalonians 5. Okay, and what's meant by these drunkards who are sleeping and not awake and how they're going to get caught up in the flood of judgment, right? Matthew 24. 1 Thessalonians 5, when they're singing peace and safety as they're chugging another bottle of beer and sudden destruction befalls them. And I don't find it funny. But uh, the warning needs to go out and these major and minor prophets need to be understood the correct way. So let's get right into it. Joel chapter 3. Hopefully you've seen Joel chapter 1 and 2. If you haven't, that's okay. Keep watching Joel 3, then you can go watch those as well. But where Joel 1 and 2 were not just dealing with the warnings that should be given to Israel, in Joel 2 we also saw the day of the Lord beginning. But here, the primary focus, not the entire, but the primary focus in Joel 3 is going to be uh, how is the day of the Lord going to end? How is it going to climax? Does it climax with the return of Christ? If so, what is he going to do when he comes? Does he just do the I dream of Jeannie Blink and those left alive are all singing Kumbaya and he cleans up the mess by himself and he rebuilds Jerusalem and Israel and the nations all by himself with the blink of his eye? No, of course not. So we get golden nuggets of information in Joel 3 about what's going to happen. And uh, you got to match it up with chapters like Isaiah 13 as well. Especially when you're talking about Jesus coming to sit and judge the nations that have gathered before him. It's not just the wicked nations that are going to be before him. That's why he'll pass over some and he'll pass through others. And when we get to Isaiah 13, you'll see what I'm talking about. 
Okay, Joel chapter 3, I'll be using the New King James Version. Here we go. Verse 1, For behold, in those days and at that time, you need to stop. You can't just keep reading over that, and you can't read quickly, wanting to get through your, your, uh, your Bible reading assignment. No, you need to stop and make sure you understand that. Part A of verse 1, before you even move on. For behold, in those days and at that time, when? Well, if we keep reading, we get our answer, but we also get our answer in Joel 1 and Joel 2. This is concerning the very near future, the end of this age, um, from the sixth seal to the conclusion of the seventh bowl battle of the great day of God Almighty, all of that is the day of the Lord's anger when he performs the intents of his heart. And he will not bring the Messiah, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, until Israel's power, the holy people and the holy city's power must be completely broken and shattered. And two-thirds of Israel must be purged. Jesus cannot come until that happens. Now you might say, wow, you must be really anti-Israel. Well, no, I'm not. Just the opposite. Now, Israel will receive a, a last chance to get out of this curse of the Song of Moses. Right? When God tells Moses and Moses tells the uh, forefathers of the current descendants of Israel, he tells them in Deuteronomy 31, 29, that they're going to do evil, this last generation of Israel especially during the fifth seal when they're found making idols of this Assyrian Antichrist, the one mentioned in Micah 5.5. 5. And uh, so evil will befall the last generation of Israel. Moses was told by God and, God, and Moses is told, instructed to tell Israel's leaders, and it's supposed to be passed down from generation to generation. When you get that fifth seal last chance, take it. Listen to Elijah and the other witness, most likely Moses. Right? Malachi 4 ends the entire Old Testament begging. Father's begging the last descendants of Israel. Take it. Turn back to me. Right? Hallelujah. And if they don't, when it is his desire, Hosea 10.10, 10, when it is Yahweh's desire, he will chasten them, right? Jeremiah 30, Hosea 10.10, 10, right? Judgment on planet earth, which is what the appointed time of the end is, six seal through the seventh bowl battle, the great day of God Almighty, right? That consists of two phases, all of that makes up Judgment Day, and Judgment Day begins with the nation of Israel. They drink the cup of madness, chaos, calamity, purging, death, whatever you want to call it. The day of doom, the day of trouble, when they are to tremble. Okay. Uh, it starts at the sixth seal, and Father decides when he's going to look over to his son and have him open the sixth seal. But Father will give Israel one last chance, but all, everything we read shows us that they won't take it. Even Isaiah 22 tells us that. It does. Isaiah 32 also tells us that Father is going to come and visit these complacent, uh, sleeping, drunk women of Israel. He will come and visit them and bring them trouble a year and some days. Isaiah 32, 10. Right? Hosea 10, 10. Revelation 3, 10. It's also called the Great Tribulation of Matthew 24, and it's called the Hour of Trial of Revelation 3, 10. And Israel will not be the only nation. All kingdoms of the world on the face of the earth will drink of this cup of madness, says Jeremiah 25, uh, verses 12 or 15 to the end of the chapter. 
especially verse 26, says all kingdoms of the world on the face of the earth. If Father decides that Jerusalem must drink the cup at the sixth seal, or start to drink it at the sixth seal, then before judgment day is done, the appointed time of the end of this age, right? Daniel eleven forty through 45, and Jesus comes in verse 45 to break in pieces all of his enemies and adversaries and to recover the remnant, which is what verse 1b is talking about in Joel 3. Right, we're getting ready to read it. So when I bring back the captives of Judah and Jerusalem, and this sentence continues, but that's verse 1. For behold, in those days and at that time, when I bring back the captives of Judah and Jerusalem, and you might say, well, that doesn't say two-thirds of Israel are going to die during that time. No, it doesn't. But Zechariah 13 does. Okay, This day of the Lord... That's mentioned in Isaiah 13 and Zechariah 13. It says two-thirds of them are going to die. And it also tells us that in places like Ezekiel chapters 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. Isaiah chapter 1 talks about this purging of Israel at the end of the age. All right, let's get into Joel 3. So starting with verse 1, and I'll pick up the pace a little bit. For behold, in those days and at that time, when I bring back the captives of Judah and Jerusalem, which is the climax to the day of the Lord, so he's going to bounce around a little bit, I will also gather all nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. So which comes first? I will bring back the captives of Judah and Jerusalem, or I will also gather all nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. And I will enter into judgment with them there on account of my people, my heritage, Israel. Revelation 16 is a good place to go. That shows us that the gathering is at the sixth bowl. Jesus doesn't come riding on the clouds of glory like world winds out of the south heading towards his destination, which is not Cleveland, believe it or not. It's Jerusalem and the daughters of Zion of Micah 4, 8. And Jesus brings the kingdom to the daughters of Zion. And you might say, well, what does that have to do with the Gentile church who abide in Christ? Well, we are immortalized that day and we are, are grafted into my people Israel. Both flocks become one, right? The uh, elect chosen ones from the my people Israel from, for, from the last 6,000 years. But also those of us who abide in Christ are the others besides these that you read about in the Old and New Testament. Um, and we are grafted in and we become one flock. So, sixth bowl is the gathering to Armageddon. Not all these hundreds of millions of soldiers from all the nations of the world, most of them are coming to take Jesus' inheritance, or at least try. But some are the good nations, did you know that? From the west, from the far parts of the north, who rejoice at the exaltation of Yahweh and his son Jesus. Lord God, Yahweh the Son. Did you know there's going to be good western nations in the valley of Armageddon? I don't think there's going to be any in the valley of Jehoshaphat. That's mainly going to be Jordanians and Lebanese. That's why you read about them getting trampled in chapters like Isaiah 63 and Zechariah 14 and Revelation 14's wine press in Revelation 19. So yeah, Isaiah 13, let's go there and just read the first five verses of Isaiah 13, which this chapter is all about the day of the Lord. Some verses are talking about how it starts, phase one at the sixth seal. Some of these verses in this chapter of Isaiah 13 talk about how it's going to climax 
and how it's going to end when Jesus comes. Uh, and you need to be thinking of when I, anytime you hear me refer to like two phases of the day of the Lord, phase one, phase two, you need to be thinking about who comes to start each phase. Is it God the Father's presence? Or is it Jesus? Uh, is it Jesus's revealing? Um, you need to be thinking about that, because as we've learned from Joel one and Joel two, our study there, that Father's presence does come to earth at the sixth seal. He visits his people. He's invisible. He does not bring Jesus, but he doesn't like what he sees, he decides he is going to have to administer the curse of the Song of Moses, Deuteronomy 32, but all the curses are detailed in Deuteronomy 28. And we know that Deuteronomy 31 ends with Moses telling the leaders of Israel, pass it on down to generation to generation. All right. The evil will befall the last generation of Israel. Because of the evil they will do in the what? Sight of the Lord. How's it the sight of the Lord? Because his presence comes. And it doesn't take him very many hours or days to realize they did not return to me. When he sees all those idols of the Assyrian Antichrist that's going to be made in Israel by their craftsmen, it's not going to be pretty. Okay, first five verses of Isaiah 13, I brought you here so that you can see there is going to be good western nations in the valley of Armageddon, and Jesus, when he appears, he'll be careful and pass over those who rejoice at the exaltation of him and his Father. Of course, as far as Jesus is concerned, it's all about the proper worship of his Father. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Uh, so yeah, so when you're reading about Armageddon in Revelation 16, this is why Jesus will pass over the good in under uh, the good who's being besieged in Jerusalem and the good nations that have come to at the uh, call at the call of Almighty God at the seventh trumpet. See, at the seventh trumpet, a court in heaven will be in session and will render a verdict. That's the proclamations of Revelation 14. That's the heavenly court verdict of Daniel 7.22, when Father has seen enough at the seventh uh, trumpet, and the 42 months are over, and he's done using the witnesses, and he raises Elijah and the other witness, most likely Moses, back to life in the sight of their enemies as they slowly ascend up into the clouds at the seventh trumpet. That is not a resurrection to life uh, arising. That is just simply for those two, two witnesses. So at the seventh trumpet, that's day 1290, when you start counting from the fifth seal abomination of desolation event. Count 1290 days exactly. Put it on your calendar when you see the abomination of desolation event. And you will see the two witnesses uh, who will be laying in the street dead for three and a half days. But on day 1290, they will come back to life. And oh, what a great fear will fall upon their enemies. And that's when Father begins multitasking during the bowls of wrath. Even though Jerusalem is still under siege, and we see that in Zechariah 14, even though they are, Father will multitask and pour the bowls out on the Euphrates River Basin. And um, Mosul and Baghdad uh, are going to start realizing, hey, we don't have Satan's power anymore. The Assyrian doesn't have Satan's power anymore. The false prophet has lost this empowerment by the Satan who was cast to earth 30 days after the abomination of desolation. There's no power, there's no lying wonders or miracles that can be performed. And now they're facing plagues by the God of the universe. And some of them during the bowls are starting to realize, wow, two witnesses just raised from the dead. Now we're being hit with plagues. The Antichrist and false prophet can't seem to stop it. Maybe we've been rooting for the wrong team all along. Too late, you already took the mark of the beast. You've been seen by the angels of heaven bowing before his image? 
not going to be pretty. Let's read the first five verses of Isaiah 13 so that you understand what's meant by the good nations that are part of Jesus' weapons of indignation during the final act of the Ezekiel 38 war. That starts at the sixth seal, right? Which acts as the sword per portion of the overall curse of the Song of Moses. But at the seventh bowl, it's Jesus' turn. And these will be some good nations that will be assisting in the threshing up and down the Nile River Basin, Isaiah 18. Um, and also uh, Baghdad, Babylon, which is saved for last. And yes, Mystery Babylon is uh, Shinar, Shishak, land of the Chaldeans. So yes, it is Baghdad. You may not understand that now. But when you see um, the basket of wickedness of Zechariah 5 be flown over to Baghdad and set up on its base in the land of Shinar, and it will speak and give wicked counsel as in a miracle to the world, you'll realize that this Assyrian who comes forth from Mosul, says Nahum 1 verse 11, in Micah 5, 5, Isaiah 14, Isaiah 10, all, Isaiah 7, Isaiah 8, all refer to this final Antichrist as an Assyrian. And Nahum 1, 11 tells us exactly what city in Assyria the final Antichrist will come from. And it is Al-Mazil, Iraq, Magog, Mosul, Mosul, uh, Nineveh. He will come forth at the first seal, seven-year peace treaty agreement, he will come forth and Israel will actually uh, sign it with him, says Daniel eleven twenty three. So we'll know if you watch close enough, you'll actually see the Assyrian that shall come forth from Mosul sitting at the table when the first seal peace agreement is signed. But he'll be revealed to the world, those who aren't you know, that much of a Berean, uh, at the fifth seal when he goes into the finished sanctuary of the tribulation temple. Here we go, first five verses. The burden against Babylon, which Isaiah the son of Amos saw. Which Babylon is this? This is actually a vision of the final Babylon. Baghdad, land of Chaldeans, Shishak, says Jeremiah 25, Shinar, says Zechariah 5, land of the Chaldeans, says this chapter, and Isaiah 14, and others. Lift up a banner on the high mountain. Raise your voice to them. Ra wave your hand that they may enter the gates of the nobles. Is this the armies looking up and seeing Jesus raise his banner on the clouds? And the answer is no. Well, then who is this person that's leading the Western nations at the battle of the great day of God Almighty when Baghdad, Babylon, is saved for last. Revelation 18, uh, Jeremiah 50, Jeremiah 51. Uh, who is this? This is the appointed general of Jeremiah 51, 27. And his armies will be part of the overall sword, severe sword, uh, that Jesus controls and yields at the battle of the great day of God Almighty, mentioned in, get this, Isaiah 27. So the appointed general of Jeremiah 51, 27 makes up, his forces make up part of the overall weapons of indignation that Jesus will control and lead in uh, Isaiah 27. How cool is that? So, this is the appointed general. Wave your hand that they may, his forces, may enter the gates of the nobles, Baghdad. I, this is Jesus talking, I have commanded my sanctified ones. Yes, you have, commander of the Lord's army. Before it's Baghdad's turn to drink. And remember, Jeremiah 25, 26 tells you, Shishak Baghdad will drink last, Revelation 18. Before... It's their turn to drink, the people of the land of the Chaldeans. Jesus will be uh, commanding his my sanctified ones. 
the armies of heaven of Revelation 19. Right? Jesus is going to be doing that in coming up the Jordan River Valley. Remember Isaiah 63's judgment on Edom. Southern Jordan gets to drink. Uh, finally, Jordan does not drink of the cup of madness during the day of the Lord until the very end, during phase two, when Jesus appears. And just like... Uh, uh, Daniel 11's appointed time of the end passage, verses 40 through 45, says that Jordan's going to get out of punishment during phase one, and they will. But Jesus will personally administer Jordans. When I say Jordan, I'm talking about Ammon, Moab, and Edom. Jesus will personally administer Jordan's punishment. That's the word of God. That's not my opinion. That's not something I want to happen it's what the Bible says is going to happen. Uh, even Ezekiel 21 goes into that a little bit. So, Jesus talking, I have commanded my sanctified ones. I have also called my mighty ones for my anger. These are the forces of Jeremiah 47, 48, 49, Jeremiah 50, and Jeremiah 51. Right, who fall under the command of the appointed general of Jeremiah 51, 27. He's the one lifting up a banner. And you, again, you see him also in Isaiah 18. And if you've never read Isaiah 18, you are missing one of the biggest golden nuggets in the entire Bible into when is Jesus coming. Isaiah 18 is where you find the month of the year. The calendar month of the year. Let me take my glasses off. Right? I'm trying to look into your eyes. This is big, brothers and sisters. I'm not big. I'm small potatoes. But what I'm sharing with you is bigger than you can imagine. If you've never really, like a Berean, plowed up Isaiah 18, you need to because this is the same guy. He's going to be threshing down the Nile River Basin during phase two of the Day of the Lord after... Uh, Jesus has uh, come to Jerusalem. Because what you need to understand is judgment on planet Earth doesn't end within 24 hours after Jesus appears in glory, riding on the swift clouds coming up the Jordan River Valley en route to Jerusalem, his inheritance, bringing the kingdom to the daughters of Zion of Micah 4 8. It's, it's not going to take just one day. Jesus is going to let this play out. And he's going to let these, my mighty ones, who are not the armies of heaven of Revelation 19, altogether we make up the weapons of indignation of Jesus, but these my mighty ones are mortal armies. And they'll all have the star of David beside their own flag, and probably a Christian cross. And the angels and Jesus, when they pass over, It'll be calm, but boy, when they see that red, green, and black flag, I don't wish it on them. Jesus is going, and his angels are going to destroy them. Jesus is going to blow fire on them, right? Zechariah 14, verse 12, and he comes in flaming fire. Jesus does, right? What is it, 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians 1? Um. You don't want to have that Palestine-looking flag at the Battle of the Great Day of God Almighty. You don't. And if you're a Christian in those nations, you need to make sure long before the Sixth Seal, you are out of those, those nations in the Middle East that are going to come against and be used as a sword. And you might think, well, if God is using the sword, which we saw in Joel 2, Father actually claims the armies of the Antichrist. He, the Antichrist, is possessed by Satan. And Father still claims that the Ezekiel 38 army of the Antichrist is Father's doing. It's, it's his army, says Joel 2. Father doesn't lie. He tells his people Israel, oh yeah, that's my doing. Right now they're working for me. They're the rod of anger of Isaiah 10. I formed it. I whistled for them, Isaiah 5, Isaiah 7. I'm going to whistle for Gog of Magog and his forces. And I'm going to use them, and, we're going to, and I'm going to have them shave you, O Israel. 
and, and purge you of your dross. I don't wish that on Israel. See, this judgment day comes on all nations. Israel drinks first, Baghdad drinks last, and everybody else drinks in between. And the hit list is in Jeremiah 25. Finishing Isaiah 13, uh, verse 3, I have commanded my sanctified ones, I have also called for my mighty ones for my anger. Right? This is phase 2 anger. Now we're talking about wrath of the Lamb. Phase 1 anger is the face of him who sits on the throne. His presence is visiting his people. And he doesn't like what he sees, but wrath of the Lamb, this is Jesus. So I have called my mighty ones for my anger, those who rejoice in my exaltation. Right? Well, look at that. A star of David next to the American flag, or even a Christian cross. Maybe the name, Lord God Yahweh, we love you, we come in your name. Hallelujah. Jesus is the God of Israel. They don't acknowledge it yet, but they will. How do I know that? Because Hosea 5, verses 14 and 15 says they will, and then that is when Jesus will be brought by Father. And Jesus will, be, Jesus will be seen coming uh, as sitting to the right hand of the power, riding on the clouds of glory. Jesus can't come until Daniel 12, 7, and uh, the uh, moment of Hosea 5, 14, and 15, when all hope is lost, they have no one else to turn to but Jesus and, and their God, Yahweh. Then they will finally receive their Messiah. But that won't come to the seventh bowl. So verse 4 and 5 of Isaiah 13, the noise of a multitude in the mountains, Isaiah 17 should be coming to mind, like that of many people, right? Hundreds of millions of our uh, soldiers. A tumultuous noise, Isaiah 17, of the kingdoms of nations gathered together, right? The UN, for example. The Lord of hosts musters the army for battle. They come from a far country. It's real important we slow down here and you differentiate this army in verse 4 of Joel 3 from the army mentioned in Joel 2. It's not the same army. It's the exact opposite. Okay? So let's go to Joel 2. Do you... Let's scroll on down till we get to the army when Father actually claims the Antichrist army, which is the rod of anger of Isaiah 10. Right, It talks about the army in verse 7, uh, but Father claims it in verse 11. Do you see that? The Lord gives voice before His army, for His camp is very great, for strong is the one who executes His word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. So you can tell that this is, when you read the whole chapter, this is against Israel. Okay? Right? Sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let the land of Israel tremble. Right? Joel 2. Yeah. This is, Ezekiel 38 talks about how Father is going to come against his flock to start the day of the Lord. That's what's going on. But my point is, Joel 3, verse 4, now this is the army of Jeremiah 47, 48, 49, 50, and 51, and Isaiah 13, right? This is the mortal army led by the appointed general, which makes up part of the uh, weapons of indignation of Jesus during the battle of the great day of God Almighty. You need to get that. Okay, Joel 3. Back to Joel 3. Verse 2, I will also gather all nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat, and I will enter into judgment with them there on account of my people Israel, my heritage Israel. See, when I say that Jerusalem and Israel is Jesus' inheritance, the daughters of Zion, it's what it says right there. My heritage Israel, Israel, whom they, the UN, whom they have scattered among the nations, right? Taking one-third into uh, captivity, taking them hostage, mainly the young people. They have also divided up my land. And we read about that uh, during the day of the Lord. When in passages that talk about how people of Gaza 
and the Palestinians will live in Israeli cities of Ekron, Ashdod, and Ascalon. By the time of the set, before the seventh bowl is ever poured, uh, Israel's been removed from the land, and people of Gaza have been given their houses. Very temporary, though, because here comes Jesus getting ready to chase them out of Ekron, Ashkelon, and Ashdod. And, and to word it, chase them out, is a kind way of saying it. He's going to kill them. Like Zechariah 14, 12 style. Uh... Right, to be whom they have scattered amongst the nations, they have also divided up my land, they have cast lots for my people, and given a boy as payment for a harlot, and sold a girl for wine, and that they may drink. These are the nations that are going to do this that come against Israel, right? You see mentioned in Ezekiel 38, Psalm 83, all the same war. Verse 4, indeed, what have you to do with me? Here we are. The Word of God is naming some of the key players that are going to be involved in taking hostages on the last generation of Israel. And I am not talking about the war between Israel and Hamas in the fall of 2023. I'm talking about a future time. I believe in, within the next decade, but I could be wrong. Look who the Word of God warns us about. Indeed, what have you to do with me? This is Jesus talking. O Tyre, Lebanon, and Sidon, Lebanon, and all the coasts of Philistia, right? Lebanon and Gaza, will you retaliate against me? Jesus is taking it personal. He already told you it's his heritage, Israel. He already told you that. Swiftly and speedily, I will return your retaliation upon your own head. So, the Ezekiel 38 army comes against Israel in Joel 2, and they're like swift steeds, right? Sudden destruction, says 1 Thessalonians 5. But here in Joel 3, Jesus' turn, now he and his weapons of indignation are going to punish Lebanon, Jordan, uh, West Bank, Gaza, and all is, you name it, Turkey, Syria, Iraq, Iran, and many other nations are going to be punished at the hands of Jesus. Verse 5, because you have taken my silver and my gold, right, that's the day of the Lord plunder, and have carried into your temples my prized possessions, right, from the temple the tribulation temple. Also, the people of Judah and the people of Jerusalem you have sold to the Greeks. Wow. Probably meaning western Turkey, I'd imagine, but I could be wrong. That you may remove them far from their borders. Behold, when Jesus says that, you better listen because it's as good as if it's already done. I will raise them out of the place to which you have sold them. Now that's talking about not only the last days taking away of Israel, but it Father has a very good memory, and it seems like just a few days ago to him where the people out of the north came and took away the northern ten tribes. And Father remembers that, behold, I will raise them out of the place to which you have sold them and will return your retaliation upon your own head. I will sell your sons and your daughters into the hand of the people of Judah. And you're thinking, surely when Jesus is here, he's not going to allow that kind of stuff to go on by Israel just as revenge. Oh, yes, he is. He's here. And he's telling you, I'm going to permit this. If you really read the Old Testament and really search the scriptures, you see that it's going to turn out to be a blessing to Israel's neighbors. The few women and children that are going to be left alive from these nations will serve Israel, especially during the first few years when the biggest amount of cleanup and building is going on. Okay, They'll be used as slave labor, but it's going to turn out to be a very, very good blessing for them because the Bible talks about how Egypt and Assyria will be so blessed by working for the people of Israel, and Jesus will dwell in their midst, that they'll eventually become like family. Jesus will treat them, and, and Israel's leadership will treat them like 
like they've been joined to the Lord. And they will be very, very happy living in Jesus' kingdom. But it won't, they won't be happy the first few months and years. Uh, Behold, I will raise them out of the place to which you have sold them and will return your retaliation upon your head. Now, some of the meaning of that verse has to do with Ezekiel 37. See verse 7? That's talking about the actual uh, armies of heaven raising uh, the dead back to life. And a lot of the dead are from the first 6,000 years or first 4,000 years. Sorry. Because Father kept his book of life. He decided on which ones looked forward to the coming of the Messiah, but didn't know his name would be Jesus, right? Yeshua. And Father wrote their names down in the book. Verse 8, I will sell your sons and your daughters, talking to Lebanon, right? In verse 4, I will sell your sons and your daughters into the hand of the people of Judah, and they will sell them to the Sabaeans, to a people far off. So after Israel has enough slaves to deal with, the rest of them are going to the Sabaeans. For the Lord has spoken. Verse 9, Proclaim this among the nations, prepare for war, wake up the mighty men, let all the men of war draw near, let them come up. Now Father's taken us back to the start, uh, or taken us back to the sixth bowl period, just before Jesus comes. He's taken us, he's back stepping a little bit. Give us more information. Let the men of war draw near. Let them come up. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am strong. This is the, talking about the sixth bowl gathering for the seventh bowl battle of the great day of God Almighty. This is the, this is the climax to the war coming on Israel, not the one they're going through now. Assemble and come. This is the one where Jesus will be revealed. Assemble and come, all ye nations, and gather together all around. Come on, come on, you want some of this? Come and get some. Cause your mighty, cause your mighty ones to go down there, O Lord. Okay, well that's talking about Isaiah 13's My Mighty Ones. Okay, so that's the good army. Right, he's telling all the nations come, but then he makes that statement, you know, uh, uh, you can say Joel talking to the Lord. Cause your mighty ones to go down there, O Lord. Verse 12, let the nations be awakened, right? When do they wake up? Well, the sixth bowl is the main part of the gathering, but the call to the good nations actually happens when the, the two witnesses raised from the dead at the seventh trumpet, less than six weeks earlier. Okay, here we go. Verse, thir okay, verse 12, let the nations be awakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat, and the ones that can't fit will have to fill the, the valley of Armageddon. For there I will sit to judge all the surrounding nations. Put in the sickle, think of Jack, uh, Zechariah 14, put in the sickle for the harvest is ripe. Now you need to be thinking about the last four verses of Revelation 14, because verses 14 through 16 of Revelation 14 is the rapture and resurrection. 1 Thessalonians 4, 14 through 17 is Revelation 14, 14 through 16, which is Revelation 19, 14 through 16. That's the rapture slash resurrection to life. It's all one event when Jesus appears. I know you don't believe that, but it is. Hallelujah. Go back and look at it again. Put in the sickle for the harvest is ripe. This, Jesus can't come until the harvest, and this is when the harvest happens, after the seventh bowl is poured. For the wine press is full, right? This is how Revelation 14 and 19 ends. The vat overflows, for their wickedness is great. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. Put your thinking cap on because you're getting ready to see a sign in the sun, moon, and stars, and you need to ask yourself, is this the sign in the sun, moon, and stars of Joel 2.10 and Joel 2.31, which, uh, which signifies that Father's presence has come to earth at the sixth seal to start the day of the Lord? Or is this sign in the sun, moon, and stars of Joel 3.15 the sign in the sun, moon, and stars at the revealing of Jesus in Matthew 24, Verses 29 through 31, which one is it? And yes, you can watch this video over and over. I know I'm rambling and I'm talking quickly because time, uh, battery life only lasts so long, but you need to watch it over and over. 
The sun and moon will grow dark, Joel 3.15, and the stars will diminish their brightness. The Lord also will roar from Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem. The heavens and the earth will shake, but the Lord will be a shelter for his people and a strength of the children of Israel. This is the revealing of Jesus Christ. This is the sign, the sun, moon, and stars of Matthew 24, 29 through 31. Okay, seventh bowl. Joel 2.10 and Joel 2.31 is the sixth seal, start to the day of the Lord. This is the moving into phase two of the day of the Lord, wrath of the Lamb, his indignation. Verse 17, so you shall know that I am the Lord your God, dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain, then Jerusalem shall be holy, and no alien shall ever, 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 ever pass through her again. Joel 3 17, and yes, I added a couple extra evers, because I wanted to make sure you caught that. That is exactly how Nahum 1 ends. Why did I bring that up? Because some people doubt with Nahum 1, 11 is talking about the final Antichrist who comes forth from Nineveh at the first seal. And once you realize that Joel 1 ends talking about the same future event as verse 17 does, which is also the same uh, event of the appointed time of the end passage of Daniel eleven forty through 45, then you get the most out of the Bible, and you even know what city the final Antichrist will come forth from when he signs the peace agreement at the first seal. <gasps> All right, how many verses are left? Uh, 18 through 21, here we go, it's millennium time, and it will come to pass in that day that the mountains shall drip with new wine, the hills shall flow with milk. Remember, this is after all of the fighting is done, which will take months. Why? Because Jesus is using mortal armies to cleanse the earth in many, <coughs> in many cases, especially when you're talking about outside of the threshing floor zone. What do I mean by threshing floor zone or kill zone? Well, Isaiah 27, 12 tells us the kill zone. That's where that's Jesus' inheritance. That's where he's personally going to go. But outside of that region, Jesus is going to let the Western nation, Christian nations handle business, purging the earth of all with the mark of the beast. Did you know that? Uh... That's also what's meant by river to the sea. Palestinians got it wrong. Uh, let's look it up. I want to read it for you before we end. Isaiah 27, 12. This is what's meant by river to the sea. And it's talking about Yahweh's, Yahweh the Son's inheritance. This is the kill zone that Jesus will personally thresh. This is the threshing floor of Revelation 14. And it shall come to pass in that day, Isaiah 27, 12, that the Lord, this is Jesus, will thresh from the channel of the river, Euphrates River, to southwestward towards the brook of Egypt, which is the Gaza-Sinai border. Always has been, always will be. And you will be gathered one by one. Remember how Joel 3 started? O you children of Israel, so it shall be in that day that a great trumpet will be blown. You, I'll let you keep reading. But that's what's really meant by river to the sea. Euphrates River Basin to the Mediterranean Sea right at, this, at the uh, Brook of Egypt's Gaza-Sinai border will be Jesus' inheritance. And you might say, well, he's going to, the whole world will belong to him. Yes, but he and his family like to have a land of their own, and that's it. And there'll be none of their enemies will be left alive in that area unless they are um, working as slave labor. But it'll turn out as an occasion of blessing for them. All right, finishing Joel 3. The hills shall flow with milk, and all the brooks of Judah shall be flooded with water. A fountain shall flow from the house of the Lord, right? The uh, millennial temple. And water the valley of Acacias. Egypt shall be a desolation, and Edom a desolate wilderness. That's southern Jordan. Because of the violence against the people of Judah, and they have shed innocent blood, to include killing a lot of Christians who refuse the mark, 
in their land, but Judah shall abide forever in Jerusalem from generation to generation. For I will acquit them of the guilt of bloodshed, whom I have not acquitted, for the Lord dwells in their midst, the Lord dwells in Zion. I added in, in their midst. Well, brothers and sisters, that ends uh, Joel 3. Hopefully my camera battery is still cranking, still alive. And uh, please ask questions in the comment sections. I never get questions. Ask questions. Uh, and make sure you watch Joel 1 and Joel 2 also. Uh, this is part of my Minor Prophets series that I'm doing. Uh, let me know which Minor Prophets you want me to do, to do next. If you don't tell me, I'll probably go with Malachi next. Wherever the Lord leads. But yeah, you, you've got uh, a particular minor prophet you want me to do next. Let me know. Leave it in the comments section. Until I see you again, God bless.